My name is Brian Richardson. Uh, I'm with Intel, but today I'm also partially speaking as uh, one of the people that is representing Tianacore. So, um, Ms. Leaf, you know him. Hi. We're going to go over uh, some of the updates for the open source community today. Um, this will start with the obligatory agenda where we're going to introduce ourselves, which we're doing right now because it's point one, uh, recent changes that we've made, plans for the future, and the part where you ask us awkward questions that we can hopefully answer. All right. For those of you that don't know, uh, Tiona Core is a community supporting EDK2, which is our open source implementation of UEFI. Uh, UEFI specification and UEFI form do not support a particular implementation. This just happens to be one that Intel has been putting in open uh, BSD style licensing since about 2004. Um, or with the original EDK, the EDK2 is an evolution of that, which came out around 2010. Uh, the mission for Tiana Core uh, maintainers is to improve contribution. It's an open source project. People don't contribute, it's just random bits on the internet. Uh, make sure the code quality is getting more towards a production uh, style. So we're really focusing on this being an implementation and not a reference. And we want to provide more regular updates and complete end-to-end -end solutions. Uh, one thing that you find in open source development is that people don't immediately show up at your project and contribute. They show up, they try your project, they find problems with it, and then they think, wait, it's open source, I can help contribute to it. So there's a large number of people that use, a small number of people that complain, and an even smaller number of people that fix that software. Uh, the problem with firmware is you need typically actual hardware to make it work. So if we don't provide a full end-to-end -end solution on something that people can buy and run, then it's less likely it's going to be adopted. Our vision is more contribution. Uh, Intel has been the primary driver on Tiana Core for, in my opinion, far too long. Uh, it's not really an open source project if only one company is playing. Uh, fortunately, ARM has been contributing a lot. More of the uh, member companies of UEFI Form have been contributing, and it's starting to grow out into more and more of an open development platform. Uh, we also want to make sure that the way that we pick our releases and schedules and process are as transparent as possible. Again, it's not a great open project if you know, code suddenly shows up and nobody knows why. We should probably put out roadmaps, uh, talk to people, make sure that you get an understanding of why we're putting things out in the world and take feedback before we do something that we're just gonna have to write a bunch of bug fixes for later. Okay, we have done things. We've done many things. Uh, changed the governance model for uh, Tiano Core. We made a transition to GitHub, yay GitHub. Uh, we've worked on a staging branch workflow so that not everything has to go into the main tree until it's not necessarily fully baked, but at least slightly warmer than room temperature. Uh, the FAT license has changed, thanks to Microsoft. Uh, we've introduced some new compilers, and we're uh, doing bug tracking in the open, which is kind of a cool thing. So Tiana Core Stewards, uh, these are the people uh, like Leaf is going to stand here and talk to you and like uh, Mike and Andrew are going to hide in the back of the room and we'll make fun of uh, whenever possible at their expense and for your amusement. Uh, the governance of a three steward model means there's a shared stewardship of the project. So you get input from multiple viewpoints, multiple companies, and it allows us to kind of grow and broaden the base of how we make our decisions and what kind of technical input we can use. Uh, in truth, Andrew and Leaf have been doing contributions for a while at a very high level, so it's not like we just suddenly went to them and said, oh, you should be stewards for no apparent reason. No, they've sort of been involved with this for years, so they grew into the role. Um, the licensing and distribution doesn't change, so we're still the same BSD license, we're still in the same place, and the concept of how you can use, consume, and choose to contribute back to the code base remains the same. The idea is that we have broader input at the top level, which helps us grow into more aspects of the open community. Uh, we used to be on SourceForge, SVN. Uh, GitHub apparently is a thing that we're doing now. Uh, they, I guess they had cooler stickers than some of the other source people, so we went with them. Um, one of the nice things is it allows us to do multiple repositories. So if you start pulling projects like uh, Michael's example for the Intel Quark on Galileo, uh, you'll see that we pull from the standard repository, a platform area, non-OSI area. So it allows us to um, have multiple uh, branches involved in a single project. Uh, this also gives us the Git books and Wiki backend to use for documentation. Uh, making documents in Word or FrameMaker and putting them in PDFs is kind of old school. 
Um, or when I went to school, we just called it school. But we should probably stop doing that. So uh, more of the online documentation is sort of the way that we're going. Staging branches. I really like staging branches. Just, you don't have to put everything in the main tree. That's the short version. The slightly longer version is in the process we've documented on the site. Um, network is a great example of this. All of the HTTPS uh, boot work is being done in a separate branch. That allows you to keep it separate from the network tree so that you can use the stable network tree without having to worry about putting that on pause while you are going through and trying to figure out if you want to implement RAM disk or HTTPS boot in a project. Once that tree has hit maturity, it will be branched by the maintainers back into the master tree, and then we'll use the same review process that we already use for you know, taking patches into the main tree. Okay, um, this is a part I think you should speak on, uh, talking about the changes to the FAT license. Yeah, so the changes to the FAT license is actually quite a huge deal in, in the Linux world. Um, one hilarious thing I've come across from the ARM side looking over the past year or two at things like the virtual machine deployment tools you have, uh, I come up and look, okay, how do we make sure to enable this on ARM? Okay, right. Oh, look, all of them are using CBIOS. Basically, the fact that the old FAT license did not permit packaging as a core free software package uh, in the Linux distributions meant that most of them were using CBIOS everywhere and no one was using UEFI in, in their virtual machines. So this is a huge change. Uh, so this gone into the Ubuntu 16.06.4 um, and it's, it's in Fedora and Debian and everything and we're really happy about this. So thank you to Microsoft. Um, there's been some work around improvements, adding support for recent uh, Clang LLVM tool chains and more recent GCC uh, with link time optimization, which I know has been frequently used uh, with the uh, Windows tool chains before, but that's now available for GCC and LLVM as well. Um, is it optimized for Linux? I think a fair statement is maybe we've actually tested it with Linux. Um, Windows. Yeah. Um, so, um, and also, Clang is quite handy because it has a bunch of analysis tools um, that you can use for finding bugs and looking at um, the sort of static analysis. Um, so a table of some actual uh, code examples um, with the situation of building with Clang link time optimization for x64. We're actually generating now even smaller code than, than Visual Studio, whereas in the past it was actually quite bloated. Um, GCC5 is entirely comparable, I would say. Um, especially on, on IA32, which may be less interesting, but anyway. So link time optimization is now not just a uh, Visual Studio thing for EDK2. Um, we have a Bugzilla server set up. Do we now have a correctly functioning certificate? Yes, we do. Sweet. Um, so this is where we want to um, have people report issues and log feature requests, um, especially also with regards to security, which I think I should hand back to you. Yeah, so the three rules of reporting security bugs to um, the Tiano Core uh, database are one, never use email, two, use the Tiano Security Core issue or Tiano Core security issues, and three, Never use email. I know that most open source people are used to email lists, and when they have a security issue, they sign their email so they can send it point to point to another person, and they have a private channel of communications. That is wonderful. We are a group of people, so that point to point solution doesn't work. If we do plain text email about security issues, everybody knows. If you're following the American election, email security apparently is a thing, so instead we're gonna use this HTTPS site 
And we're going to put it in a group that does not expose the issues on announcement and is only available to people who are reporting the issue or on the uh, USRT. So that way, when you do things in normal Bugzilla uh, for Tiana Core, they are publicly accessible because of the open part. Security, we like to make sure we fix things before we disclose them because we're in a different color hat than the black one. So um, yeah, that's why we're not using that process. I know some open source people are going to go, well, gosh darn it, email is amazing. Yes, it's great. I still use it as well, but not for this application. OK, we have made plans. Uh, one, the website. We're going to fix that. We know the website is not our strongest link in Tianacore right now. There's a lot of historical information uh, that we need to collect and put into a better representation. Uh, from the SVN to GitHub transition, a lot of the information from the old site has been replicated, but not linked as well as it should be. So we're going to make it easier to find and try to get away, again, from the you must get a PDF reader to see documents type of mentality that most of the software people are still using. Uh, we've talked a lot in open sessions about test framework and test cases. Uh, we believe we should get us some of that because if we're doing an open project and we're not showing how we as contributors are doing our testing or not giving an equivalent framework, it's not as effective. So if, say, at Intel we have some fancy automated way of doing tests, that's great. But if I give you just the, the code and not the way to verify it, if I give you all the ingredients but and the recipe, but not necessarily what it should taste like or some of the baking aspects of that, you're not going to come out with the same thing that we came out with. I just had lunch. That uh, food mentality is still fresh in my mind. Uh, the other thing we want to do is improve our release management. We do releases. We do them frequently. Uh, we're not always putting out things like roadmaps. And our typical approach to the UDK release cycle, when we do validated snapshots, is typically four to five quarters. That's forever in software development time. We probably ought to get some kind of, of standard labeled release two to four times a year so that we can actually you know, get with more of the modern program. We're doing enough work internally on EDK2 to make that happen, but we're not actually exposing that as an external release. Uh, what we want to do is get input from people who are consuming our code on what a good uh, release cadence is. Because once you start a product in firmware, you're typically not going to go back and say, oh, it was two months after I started. I'm going to go and put the newest core in. No, you're not going to do that. Uh, that would be you know, probably foolish and optimistic. Uh, but you should have something between I'm getting a release every couple of weeks, like you know, Adobe Flash or Java, and I'm getting a release every year and a half, like Star Wars movies. Uh, we, something in between those two things would be great. So the way we're looking at it is that we'll have sort of a fall down from platforms. Uh, platforms get fixed because they are, you know, the, they're where you see the problems. Uh, some of the things will go back into staging branches for particular features. Other things will be uh, reported against the main EDK2. And then those things fall into a UEFI development kit or UDK release, which is our current representation of a stable snapshot versus what's coming uh, straight out of the fire hose of open source. So these need to go through uh, review of design requirements, uh, implementing the actual features, and then testing the darn thing before we let it loose into the world. Uh, I like to release software more like doves and less like wild bears escaping from the zoo. So some testing is nice. Uh, speaking of features, we do have an upcoming UDK 2017 release. Uh, the naming convention, UDK, UEFI Development Kit, is supposed to um, designated from the EDK because we came up with EDK back when there wasn't a U in UEFI. So uh, that's kind of our convention for this is the stable snapshot. UDKs are typically available in a full zip package or we'll give you the hash to get the uh, Git branch that represents that. So this is focused on specifications and errata that will be ratified at the beginning of 2017. So that is ACPI 6.1, UEFI 2.6, uh, the errata for PI 1.4, and upgrades to the tools and infrastructure. This includes getting to a newer version of uh, OpenSSL. Uh, we have already done this in the branch, but we've transitioned away from MASM to NASM. So that allows more variety of platform builds. Uh, there is an MP initialization library for the CPU coming out and a number of generic or function specific drivers. Uh, SATA controller and PCI host bridge are now generic DXEs um, and 
the uh, PISMM CPU DXE SMM, which is really hard to say and has SMM in it twice for some naming convention reason, is tied to the CPU MP implementation. Uh, open platforms. Oh, I like open platforms. Uh, they are easier to get than reference platforms, they're cheaper to get than reference platforms, and they overall allow more people to consume and play with firmware. Uh, so folks are more likely to go out there and try firmware uh, if they have a $99 to $200 board to play with, and less likely if they have to sign a bunch of NDAs. So this gives us more example code for new developers, it gives us numbers of things to test, so you have a variety of platforms to try your things against. So when you come to the plug fest, you spend more time talking to your friends and less time sweating over you know, debug apparatus. Um, centralized validation would be good. If we have more platforms, we have more things to generically kind of crunch on. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about open development since you've done a lot of it recently. Yeah, so um, having many different platforms, full platform ports available in the same source tree makes it quite easy to find the common bits that actually probably should just be a core library re reusable by everyone. Uh, we have a couple of very concrete examples of this in the ARM space and I'm sure there's going to be quite a lot as we get to see more in, in other architectures as well. Um, Obviously, I, this is kind of my thing. I was up here last year talking about how I was creating a new platform repository where I was going to keep things until we could figure out a way of resolving this within Tianocore. Uh, and we are now uh, finally getting to the point where there's been public discussion on the list. There's a proposal going through. Michael's promised to send out a revised one by the end of this Plugfest, even today maybe. Um, so if you do have any more input on that, then um, please um, come forward with it. But my goal is that we will have a platforms tree owned by Tianocore um, by the end of this year, which people can contribute to under normal Tianocore guidelines. So, summary? Sure. So Tianocore, supports open source development around the UEFI specification using EDK2, which is good for all of us. Um, the big recent improvements are the transition to Git. I, I will emphasize the transition to Git over the transition to GitHub. Both have, are beneficial, but moving to Git was a huge help for a lot of us. Um, and you know the support for newer tool chains and new tool chain features and we're going to keep working to improve uh, code quality and availability of um, open platform code also for use for people for learning and getting involved in UEFI development. And thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So the question is, you know, we have the UDK 2017 release planned, which is essentially a, a stable release of EDK2. Is there a plan for an EDK3? Not that I am aware of. Um, we've had that discussion inside of Intel, and I don't know if we've had it out in the, the community as well, but the goal is just to try to kind of incrementally improve on EDK2. We haven't seen a need for any large enough changes that require, you know, bumping that framework number up. Um, so I don't know of any right now. Um, if something does come along, that would be a probably a pretty big community discussion. I'm sure the, the stewards would get together at some you know place to imbibe and discuss future plans. Um, but I haven't seen anything come along that you know we've we've seen a lot of things where we say we want to like add this little thing or add more metadata or do something else that would kind of incrementally improve it. But another kind of giant overhaul. I don't know if it's necessary at this time. The question is about open platforms. Uh, there are timelines for ones that you could just go out and buy retail. Um, there are, there is a plan for, uh, we've already done, so at Intel, and I'll let you talk about the ARM stuff, but at Intel we have uh, a minnow board project that is essentially an open schematic uh, platform. And those are not, you know, they'll be available mostly through like distributors uh, or mail order sites like Arrow. Um, and the one that's in play right now doesn't follow our best practice for what an open platform looks like from an Intel standpoint and doesn't actually utilize the, the tree the way that it's designed for open platforms. Uh, there will be one coming in 2017 that will be closer to that model 
for us, and uh, that'll be one that I could recommend. Uh, do you have any from the ARM side? We do have a shortage of cheap mass market available platforms. We have a large variety of, of much more expensive development platforms, um, and it is something being worked on, and it's really quite frustrating that I can't give a date, but real soon now. And keep in mind that, you know, Intel and ARM are the only people that can like go out and build these little boards or charter people to build these boards. Um, we have had some of our customers come to us and say we want to do projects and use an open development model uh, for the promotion of the, their concept or general market they want to get into. So if you happen to use some of our silicon and they're interested in doing that in the future product, you should have a conversation with us so that in the beginning you can at release be ready to go with uh, open firmware of some type you know, based on UEFI. Um, so I think that you know, a lot of people will put a board out and then go, oh, we should have put that out in open source. That'd be great because we're trying to put out a development kit and it's open all the way down to the firmware layer. And then once they ship the board, they realize that they're missing some things. They may have signed the BIOS a little too strong and you can't update it in the field with the one that you built. Or maybe a debug header was a great idea. Whoops, we didn't ship one. So those are things to discuss uh, with the Tiana Core community at large before you actually put the product out. Or with a representative, if you have some NDA issues that would prevent you from having that discussion out on an open, uh, like an email list, then maybe there's somebody you could privately go to, like you know, Andrew and Mike don't look busy right now in the back, so you could bug them about it.